For ye were sometimes dark, for ye were sometimes darkness, but now are ye light in the Lord. Walk as children of light, for the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness and righteousness and truth, proving that is acceptable unto the Lord. And have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them. For it is a shame even to speak of those things which are done of them in secret. But all things that are reproved are made manifest by the light. For whatsoever do it, whatsoever do it make manifest is light. Wherefore he said, We awake thou that sleepest, and arise from the dead, and Christ shall give thee light. See then that ye walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise. Redeeming the time, because the days are evil. Wherefore, be ye not unwise, but understanding what the will of the Lord is. And be not drunk with wine, wherein is excess, but be ye filled with the Spirit. Speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. Singing and making melody in your hearts to the Lord. Giving thanks always for all things unto God and, and the Father in the name of Jesus Christ. <coughs> In the name of the, our Lord Jesus Christ, submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of the Lord. Thank God for the reading and the hearing of the Lord. Amen. Praise the Lord. Our sermonic hymn is Fill Me Now. It's hymn number 383. Mm -hmm.
Spirit and fill us now. Come, Lord, in your fullness and your strength, in your own gentle way, and fill your people now. May no one leave this sanctuary empty today, but fill us up, Lord, with your Holy Spirit. Grant that everything that shall be said shall only glorify your name, as we seek to know that it comes only from the Holy Spirit. Hear us now, we pray, in Jesus' name, amen and amen. Please be seated. The personality of the Holy Spirit and the power of the Holy Spirit comes with the outpouring and the filling of the Holy Spirit. Turn with me to Ephesians chapter 5. We're going to look at the B part of verse 18, but we'll read the whole verse. And be not drunk with wine, wherein is excess, but be filled with the Holy Spirit. I borrowed the title from that verse, Be Filled with the Holy Spirit. We don't want to misunderstand anything on this important subject today. All believers, all believers have all of the Spirit. Amen? All believers have all of the Spirit. But here's the problem. The Spirit does not have all believers. The Spirit does not have all believers. He is not in full control in their lives. To be filled with the Spirit means to be controlled by Him. The word filled in the Greek, pleroho, which is derived from pleto, which is derived from Perez. All those three words, including the root word, means one thing, to be made complete, to be filled up. When the Holy Spirit is filling you, it does not use table etiquette. You know, you are taught that when you fill a glass of water, it should not be filled to the rim when you are giving someone a drink of water. It should clo come close to the rim, but not up to the rim when you are offering someone a glass of water. That's common etiquette. Well, the Holy Spirit doesn't use that etiquette. Glory to God. The Holy Spirit means that He fills you to the overflow. He completely fills you up. We go to the gas station and we pump our gas and the pump clicks to say that the tank is full. 
but we tried still to round off the dollar by click, click, trying to fill it up some more. Getting your last penny's worth. Amen? So, the Holy Spirit is not doing a half job. We are not looking at a glass that is half full in order to be positive about how we feel concerning the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit wants you to be filled up. He wants you to be filled up. Paul here, he was talking to the Ephesian church and he spoke to them concerning shunning sin and, and bad company and unsaved people. And he came down and he says, do not be unwise but understanding what the will of the Lord is. And then he explains the will of the Lord for the saints. You see, those of us who used to drink before, we don't drink no more. Hallelujah. We don't find pleasure in social or habitual drinking. <clears throat> the places you used to go and find your high in it, you don't go there no more. Hallelujah. Although you. some of us still lust after the dancing and the gallivanting and what Paul calls the carousing. We still find that there's a little place in us that seem to want some of these things. You know why? It's because you are disacknowledging the space that the Holy Spirit has inside of you. He's there, but you don't want to acknowledge him. And we tend to want to look at everything as, well, this is not sin but this is sin. It's not because it's not sin why it's not good for you. It's because it is not in line with who you are now in Christ Jesus. Because in order for you to partake of that, then you will have to do it with those who do not know Jesus. And the Bible is telling you, separate yourselves. Because evil communication corrupts good manners. So the Holy Spirit wants all of you. He wants to complete you in Christ Jesus. And in order for him to do that, he must fill you up. And you know what? He doesn't just pour you to the rim and stop. He keeps pouring every day, every hour, every minute. He's constantly pouring into you so that you remain filled up. Amen? So you don't wake up this morning on a glorious high and tomorrow morning I don't feel spiritual as I felt yesterday no because you would have used up a quarter a one eighth a fifty percent but the Holy Spirit does not operate like that the Holy Spirit keeps pouring into you so that you remain filled up The Holy Spirit 
is not acknowledged by the persons in whom he dwells. You know, I can go somewhere with you, and when we leave church, we are brothers and sisters, and then I meet some big folks outside, and you are with me, and I'm around shaking hands. Hey, how you doing, buddy? Long time no see, and you're walking behind me, and I'm shaking hands, but I don't acknowledge your presence. I don't introduce you to my friends because I don't want them to meet you. We treat the Holy Spirit just like that. He's supposed to be with us everywhere, but when we meet our big friends, we forget that he's there. When we begin to socialize, we keep ignoring that voice that is saying, hey, I'm here. Because he never shuts up either. He's always telling you that he is there. So why be filled with the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit? Remember all the time when you think about the Holy Spirit, you're not thinking about a separate entity or person from God the Father, because the Holy Spirit is the Spirit of God the Father. That's what the book of Genesis says, that the Spirit of God hovered over all the earth. So it's the same Spirit of God in the Old Testament, he's referred to in the Hebrew as Ruach. In the New Testament, he is Pneuma. It's the same person, only different language. So we know him as the Spirit of God. So the Word of God commands us, here's the number one reason, we should be filled with the Spirit. The Word of God commands us to be filled with the Spirit. This be part, this part in chapter 5 of Ephesians verse 18 is not a suggestion. You have two commandments in that verse. And be not drunk with wine, wherein is excess or debauchery, or a prodigal-like foolishness. Amen? Second commandment. Be filled with the Holy Spirit. So that's not optional, is it? God's commandments are not optional. You can put them down and take them and take them up when you are pleased. And Paul uses this comparison because drinking strong drink and drinking to excess can lead to a lot of things, but the high is temporary. The high is temporary. That's why people do it every day, because yesterday's drink wear off, and the drunkard says, what's better than a drink, another drink? But when you keep on being filled with the Holy Spirit. It's a different kind of filling. Look with me to Proverbs chapter 20, verse 1. Proverbs 20, verse 1. When you're there, say amen. Proverbs 20, verse 1. 
When you're there, say amen. Wine is a mocker. Strong drink is raging. Whosoever is deceived thereby is not wise. Wine is filled with mockery. Strong drink is riotous and brawler. It's a riotous brawler. And whosoever errs or reels because of it is not wise. So here Paul says in, 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 in verse 17 of Ephesians chapter 5, Wherefore be ye not unwise, but understanding the will of God. Want to hear what drinking can do to you? Go to Proverbs 23 with me. Proverbs 23 with me. And we're going to read from verse 30. When you're there, say amen. Proverbs 23, verse 30. Are you there yet? Amen. They that tarry long at the wine... They that go to seek mixed wine, look not thou upon the wine when it is red, when it giveth his color in the cup, when it moveth itself all right. At the last it biteth like a serpent and stingeth like an udder. Thine eye shall behold strange women, and thine heart shall utter perverse things. Yea, thou shalt be as he that lieth down in the midst of the sea, or as he that lieth upon the top of a mast. They have stricken me, shalt thou say, and I was not sick. They have beaten me, and I felt it not. When shall I awake and seek it again? <laughs> what wine can do to you. You lose consciousness, number one, of who you are. You lose consciousness of where you are, and you lose consciousness of what happens to you. The Holy Spirit is unlike that. He keeps you at a place where he wants you to remain and know him. So the word of God commands us not to be filled with wine, drunk with wine, drinking in excess, becoming useless, becoming unconscious, because earlier in the passage, the Bible says that we ought to awake and be conscious of the state in which the world is in now. And if you're drunk, you cannot know. But he says, be wise, having understanding, knowing what the will of God is. Do not drink to excess but be filled with the Holy Spirit. Saints of God, that's a command from God. That's his commandment. That's what we call a New Testament commandment. Be filled with the Holy Spirit. Jesus says in the book of Luke, which of you fathers would have a child to ask of him a snake, a, 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 a fish, and you give him a snake, or bread, and you give him stone. And if the unrighteous fathers know how to give good gifts unto their children, how much more will the Father give you the Holy Spirit 
if you ask it of him. Second reason why you need to be filled is because the work of God demands it. You can't do God's work without being filled with the Holy Spirit. Those people who are trying to do God's work without being filled with the Holy Spirit, without, being, without acknowledging the outpouring of the Holy Spirit in their lives is just full of self. It's just me, myself, and I. Acts chapter 1 verse 8 says the power comes after the Holy Spirit has come upon you. Not before, but after the Holy Spirit has come upon you. After he has, you have experienced the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Then the power comes upon you. Then guess what? You are out of the picture and the Holy Spirit takes over. And you begin to understand that all the glory goes to God. All the glory goes to God. People are gonna say, man, you're so good. You are so kind. You are this, you are that. And then you may wallow in it for a moment but soon, quick after that, the Holy Spirit will come. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he sticks you on you. Oh, oh, give God all the glory. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> all the glory belongs to God because I have done nothing of myself, but I do it for Jesus' sake through the power of the Holy Spirit. Do it for Jesus' sake. The Bible says in Acts chapter 2, verse 4, they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them Utterance. You know, I love to hear some church people boast about how they speak in tongues. I just love to hear them talk about it. And the way they talk about it is as if nobody else is any good because they know how to speak in tongues. So they got that utterance all by themselves. So they boast about it. There's no grace. There's no glory to God. It's all by themselves. But it's the spirit that gives utterance. The work of God demands the outpouring of the Holy Spirit and the infilling of the Holy Spirit. So how do we get filled with the Holy Spirit of God? Why do we need to be filled and how do we get filled with the Holy Spirit of God? It begins with repentance. You see, God is not going to pour new wine in the old back. Amen? Amen? The wine sack. Because that has already made, been made for us by cheaper wine. So God is not going to pour his new wine into that old sap because it's going to burst and it's going to leak and God's good wine is going to go to waste. So he wants to make you a new vessel for his use. 
so he can pour his Holy Spirit in you, you must become a new creation in Christ Jesus. You cannot be the old bag. You've got to become a new one. The old sock is no good. He's got to prepare this new one for himself. How is he going to do that also? This morning I was thinking, I, I didn't even know why I was thinking that until now. Believe me. Because I wasn't thinking of my message now. But I was thinking of the, the water tanks that they build back home. And I was saying, how can it hold water for so long? without the water seeping away. And I was trying to formulate it in my mind as to how they do it. Then I'm saying, how long after they have completed the job and it catches the water? That water must be bitter. <laughs> what do they do to it to make the water drinkable? And it's now I'm realizing that when the new bag is created, God has to still cleanse it. Amen? He has to still cleanse it. So that the new wine become palatable. It's usable because it's poured into a new container that is cleansed. First, he empties it out of sin and self. Because you can't pour more on what is already filled up. If it's filled with something else, you got to throw that away. So in order to start filling up with the new content. And it's only the blood of Jesus that can wash. <laughs> Glory to God. It cleanses better than bleach. Only the blood of Jesus that can wash you and make you ready for the inpouring of the Holy Spirit. John chapter 1, the Bible says, all have sinned. If any man says that he has no sin, he's a liar and he makes God a liar. If we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. That's what the old wine does. It causes us to deceive ourselves. And the truth is not in us. But the Bible says in verse 9 of, of 1 John chapter 1, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to do what? To cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Because a holy God has to dwell in a holy place. He's preparing you to be his temple. And so he must come in and clean house. One president went out of power. A new president came in power. Within six hours, the White House has to be cleaned of every presence of the old president. Every picture must be removed. Walls must be repainted. Mattresses and bed linens and towels and shampoos and everything must be changed for the new president to come in and reside in the White House. And it must be ready after he swore in. Guess what? When you come to the office, 
You need uh, this altar. A work is done with on you quicker than they can work on the White House. New painting, new washing, new cleansing. Glory to God. Never to be dirty anymore. Once you are cleansed, you are cleansed. Because in comes the new ruler of your life. He is called the Holy Spirit. He has governance of your life. He now teaches you where to sit, when to sit, when to get up, how to get up, how to walk, because he now leads you to walking in the light. He takes you out of the darkness. So first you need to be cleansed. Holy Spirit can live in dirty house. <laughs> he has to clean it. One drop of sin can't be in that house. He must clean it. He forgives you. He cleanses you of all, not some of your unrighteousness. All your unrighteousness. All of it. He now clothe you in his righteousness. Glory to God. Last week, we said he superimposes himself on you. He gives you a new look, a new outlook. You must be empty for the Holy Spirit to fill you. Empty. And so you must pray to God, Lord, burn out every dross. Remove every dirt. Pour your blood, Lord Jesus. Don't just give me that little drop. I know it's stronger than Dawn dishwashing liquid. <laughs> My wife don't like that one. <laughs> but it's strong. It's strong. It is the strongest detergent that can ever cleanse is the blood of Jesus Christ. No fuller's soap or bleach can cleanse like the blood of Jesus. When God comes to clean house, he cleans house. Glory to God. So why you do that? What happens when you empty out everything? When you throw out everything? The Bible uses the word purge to cleanse sin. You must be purged of your sin, which means you take a spiritual washout. When you go to the spiritual bathroom, it's like when you're going for a colonoscopy. You're doing a spiritual watch out. It's not a pleasant experience. Glory to God, most of the times. But it is more than necessary. It is obedience to God. Therefore, it's not just a necessity. It's a demand. God demands that you do that. So there is that cleansing, there is that purging in order for you to stay alive after that. You have to replete. Notice I didn't say replenish. You have to replete. You have to be filled up now with something new. Something new. If you replenish, then you put back what's old. But now you're going to replete. You're going to Fill up with something new. And the reason you have to do that is because you have developed a new thirst. You become thirsty. For something new. John chapter 7, verse 37, Jesus is speaking. 
And he's telling them at that great feast in Jerusalem. At the last day of the feast, he stood and he looked at all these Sanhedrin and these Pharisees and all these people gathered there and he said to them, if any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. He saw that although they were celebrating and drinking of all the great wine of that time, they were still lacking something. They couldn't have enough of that. But he says, if any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. He that believeth on me, as the scripture had said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. Why? Because Jesus is continuously pouring. Therefore, he has replaced the appetite for that which is temporary. And he's filling you up with a new wine. That's why you have lost the appetite for the drinking of the alcohol. Because there's no space for it anymore. <laughs> Jesus had already removed that and he has poured in new stuff. Remember at the wedding at Cana? The groom says, after we have well drunk. Now you pull out the good stuff. But we are so filled with the old stuff. Jesus was teaching a lesson there, you know. Now we can hardly drink any of the new stuff. Because now you pull out the good old good stuff when we have well drunk. And and we have drank all this bad stuff already. Now you fill out the premium stuff. <laughs> the top shelf stuff. Where you get this from? Glory to God. The man who can change what you looked like before and make you into something new. Jesus use that demonstration to explain his purpose. I can change you from the tasteless, insipid thing that you are into something more tasteful, more potent than anything else you've ever known before. So Jesus says, if any man thirst, let him come to me. He said it to the woman at the well in John chapter 4. He said, if you had asked of me, I would have given you to drink, and it would be in you, springing up into everlasting life. Because I wouldn't stop pouring. My supply is endless. I'm going to re replace your old desires with a new satisfaction. Glory to God. <laughs> Amen. You need satisfaction. You need to feel complete. So you need Jesus to fill your thirst. Amen. And ask of God and he will fill you up. Nothing good will he withhold from those who walk upright. That thirst brings you to humility because you are in need now, you see. You're in need of something better than you have flushed. <laughs> You're in need of something better
than the life you had before, the unsatisfactory life. Your need of something better than the next morning hangover. Glory to God. <laughs> you, need some, you need something better. You know, every time somebody gets drunk, it's always the last day they're going to drink. <laughs> when the alcohol has taken possession of them and the bad feeling comes, then they say, this is the last. I'm never drinking again. Never drinking again. And by the time they leave their house and get out there, they want to drink. Never satisfied. So Jesus wants you to humble yourself and be willing you see, he can make you the offer, but he's not going to force it on you. You have to show a willingness to receive what Jesus wants to give to you. You can offer me gold, but unless I'm willing to receive it, then I'm not going to get it. Because I'm not going to accept it. And sometimes it takes great humility to accept what is offered to you. It takes a yielding and being willing to accept it. Romans chapter 6. Romans chapter 6. Verses 13 through 19 says. When you're there, say amen. amen. You're there. Neither yield ye your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin. I'm talking about yielding now. But yield yourself unto God, yourselves unto God as those that are alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. For sin shall not <laughs> for sin shall not have dominion over you for ye are not under the law but under grace. What then shall we sin because we are not under the law but under grace? God forbid or absolutely not. Know ye not that to whom ye yield yourselves servants to obey, his servants ye are to whom ye obey, whether of sin unto death or of obedience unto righteousness. But God be thanked that ye were the servants of sin, but ye have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered you. Being then made free from sin, ye became the servants of righteousness. I speak after the manner of men because of the infirmity of your flesh. For as ye have yielded your members servants to uncleanness, to iniquity, and to iniquity, even so now, yield yourselves, your members, servants to righteousness unto holiness. So you have to yield, give up your will. See, there's a sign on the road that says, when you're coming out from a minor road into a major roadway, there's a sign there that says yield. And that's the reason a lot of accidents happen at, at these intersections. Somebody fails to yield. And it causes problems. You have to obey the road signs. 
The road signs of the Holy Spirit says you must yield the members of your body unto righteousness. Some of us have a way of withholding, yielding our hand because it's just supposed to give. Yielding our feet because it's supposed to walk. But there are times when we we refuse to yield our hands because they will give if we let them. We fail to yield our feet because they will take us to church if we let them. <laughs> Glory to God. Amen. We don't yield anything that we believe is going to take from us and give unto righteousness. I like when Sister Green tell our feet, you're going to church doctor or no doctor. <laughs> shoes or no shoes, you're going to God's house. Okay? Because she healed them to righteousness. She's going where she wants to be filled up with new wine. Right. Hallelujah! Wow. Where she's going to be poured into and no foot is going to stop her. Hallelujah. Amen. Even if the dog eat her shoes, she's coming to church. <laughs> Glory to God. Hallelujah! The Bible says that you have to yield your body and your will so that God can fill you up. The disciples went to Samaria in Acts chapter 1. And Samaria was one of the places Jesus had told the disciples not to go to while he, well, before they really got saved. Before they were filled with the Holy Spirit, they shouldn't go to Samaria. But in Acts chapter 1, verse 8, he says, after you are filled with the Holy Spirit, after you have been empowered, you're going to go to Samaria. So they went to Samaria. And when they went there, Peter and John started to tell them about the Holy Spirit. They said, we have not as much as heard of the Holy Spirit. Peter said, you have not received him? No. And they laid hands upon them, and they received the Holy Spirit. Immediately after that, Philip was so filled he must have got an additional supply of the Holy Spirit. He walked out yielding himself to the power of the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit says, man, there's an Ethiopian fellow. He's going home from Jerusalem back to Ethiopia. And he is the queen's main man. He's chauffeur driven. You can't miss him. But he has an interest in what is holy. And he swooped Philip over and he put Philip there on that chariot. And Philip says, what are you reading, man? He says, I'm reading Isaiah 53. <laughs> but I don't understand a word he's saying. <laughs> Philip must have said, well, you wouldn't. Because spiritual things are spiritually discerned. Hallelujah. But I'm going to show you how to understand that in a while. And he preached a little sermon to him and told him of baptism, water baptism. And the man came down to a cow pasture and he saw a cow pond. And he said, there is water. I don't care if it's clean, dirty, muddy or not. Why can't I be baptized? <laughs> Philip took him, baptized him in the name of the Father, of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. And the man went away rejoicing, and Philip went back preaching all the way. He never stopped preaching from he left the guy, the, the chariot. He preached all the way back to Caesarea, filling people with the Holy Spirit and getting them saved for the kingdom of God. That's the zeal we need, isn't it? When we're filled with the Holy Spirit to the overflow, it overflows to someone else. So what, what's the result of being filled with the Holy Spirit? 
we get power for service. Power for service. Nothing can hold us down. No bad feeling, no hurting. I've got to go to serve the Lord. And this power is manifested in soul winning. Sometimes you win souls not so much by talking and preaching, but by acting. People see you doing the right thing, want to be like you. They discover that the reason you are the way you are is because you are saved, sanctified, and filled with the Holy Ghost. Glory to God. There was a little man in Samaria. He was a little trickster. When Peter and John were laying on hands and they saw people, he saw people start rejoicing in the Holy Spirit, speaking in tongues and glorifying God, he called Peter aside and said, Me a little of that. <laughs> <laughs> Sell me a little of that. You ever see people coming to church like Simon the Saucer? Want to buy some of that? The only way I will give an offering is if you do this or do that. Simon the Saucer, unless you make me preach more, I won't give no offering. Unless you make me sing more, I'm not giving no offering. Unless you make me announce me more, I'm not giving no offering. Sell me a little of that. Peter grabbed Peter and said, Get be behind me, Satan. You are devising an evil thing. This is not for sale. Hallelujah. This bar is from God. You can't buy it. It is Jesus who by his grace pours himself into us and fills us up with himself and he keeps pouring himself into us and we are overflowing, hallelujah. What you're seeing here is the overflow. Glory to God. It's flowing out of us. People are receiving, being saved. My friend, when you manifest the power and the personality of the Holy Spirit, God will give you the opportunity to realize the satisfactory result of that which he has given you. That's what Philip, can you imagine how Philip felt that day? When he baptized the eunuch. Oh my. The greatest person in the eunuch's life was the queen of Ethiopia. But now he met Jesus, the king of kings, the king of queens, the king of all human race, the king who everyone needs to meet. And he bows at his feet and he calls him Lord. Can you imagine how Philip felt when he came out of that pond? All wet. There was no beach towel to dry him on. <laughs> Glory to God. He started to preach from there. And he never stopped preaching all the way to Caesarea. He preached and people got saved. And people got filled with the Holy Ghost. He was so excited. That God could use him in such a way. I don't know about you. But that's how I want God to use me. So I'm always giving an altar call. No matter where. Some people don't want me to preach at their funerals because I give altar call. Some churches don't want me to preach in their churches because I give altar call. But that's the whole purpose of preaching glory to God. It's to win souls for Jesus. 
It's to build those souls that need building up. Because we're never perfect. Paul says, not as though I have already attained unto. It's not as if I have reached. But Jesus is still pouring into me. He's still pouring. He's still pouring. He's still pouring. He's still pouring. He's never stopped. He's doing it and pouring and pouring and pouring. Hallelujah. How is it with you? When was the last time you exuded the personality and the power and the infilling of the Holy Spirit? When was the last time you touched somebody and they say, man, that felt different. I was sharing the other day, I, I often walk into churches and I just sit down and somebody will come to me and say, hey, would you pray? And I'm saying, this man don't even know me. I'm just here to chill. <laughs> you know because wherever you are you change the atmosphere the Holy Spirit in you takes charge of the atmosphere so whatever was going to offend you the Holy Spirit puts you in such a position that the devil can't show up <laughs> hallelujah He has to keep quiet because there's somebody in here who knows Jesus. Somebody in here, something is flowing out of that person. My friends, until you feel like you need that in your life, you need to continually seek God. Lord, I'm thirsty. I'm thirsty. I heard Arnold Schwarzenegger and, and his show the other night with the, 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 the apprentice. There was a young lady who was a leader of a group, and he said to her, to the group, he says, you know, normally we would have let her go, but he fired somebody else. He says, I'm keeping her. You know why? She's thirsty. She's thirsty for this. Glory to God. When have you been so thirsty for the Holy Spirit? When have you been, have you allowed everything else to crowd your mind? Your heart? That you lose the thirst for the Holy Spirit? Then you will become cold like the church in Ephesus. You become cold. You will have lost your first love. There is no zeal as there is no thirst for the right things. So today, my friends, I challenge you. Be filled with the Holy Spirit.
let him come unto me. And I will pour into him. And in him there will be an overflow. An overflow that will flow unto others and unto eternal life. Pastor Lord, would you just pray the closing prayers? God, our Father and our Sovereign Lord, Father, we seek you to be like you. So as your son said, I will send another comfort that comes from the Father and that will dwell inside of you. We rejoice this day, Father, that we have your enlightenment. Lord, that we walk around with a conduct that comes from heaven, that your righteousness may show in the world to draw others, to attract others unto you. So Father, I pray that every soul, believer, washed in the blood will go forth with your handprint, with your inscription on them that the world may see and be drawn to you. Father, we can't do it within our own power, but we know by your righteousness, through your Son, that we can do all things. So we ask for your power again, to be filled again, to go as your servants into the world, humbly with your power, to accomplish your will. God, guide us and keep us, and fill us up. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Hymn number 147, I'll greet the one.
The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord cause his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up the light of his countenance upon you. And the Lord give you peace now, henceforth, and forevermore. God bless you. See you at 6 p.m. Amen.